Russia has just over 23,000 miles of coastline and almost 70 major ports. But despite having so much water space, the country is basically landlocked. This is because of one major issue, ice. Giant ice sheets essentially shut down most Russian ports for about half of the year. Combine this limited port access with the crushing sanctions imposed by the West, and Russia has basically turned into a warehouse with nowhere to sell its stuff. That is, until Putin decided the only way forward was to create a new Suez Canal. But how? First opened in 1869, the Suez Canal is a 193-kilometer man-made waterway in Egypt that stretches from the Gulf of Suez in the south to Port Said in the north. It is still the quickest way to get goods from Asia to Europe and vice versa. It's difficult to underestimate just how important the Suez is to the world economy, but some of these figures should illustrate that nicely. On average, the Suez Canal has, in recent years, seen at least 20,000 ships pass through it. These ships carry 12% of the world's total trade volume and 30% of all containerized goods. That means there is a 30% chance that most daily goods you use at some point cross through the Suez Canal. To put these figures another way, the canal sees an average of 50 ships per day passing through its waters, carrying three to nine billion dollars worth of cargo every day. But it's not just the volume of trade that matters, it's what's being carried. Due to the huge amount of oil and natural gas extracted in the Middle East, the Suez sees approximately 10% of all the world's oil and 8% of all the natural gas in the world passes through at some point. And disruptions to this waterway can have a huge impact. Several years ago, the motor vessel Ever Given was traversing the canal when abnormally strong winds overtook her. These winds pushed her into the sandy sides of the canal and blocked traffic. Though she was freed after six days, the stoppage delayed almost 500 vessels and cost the Suez Canal Authority an estimated $900 million in damages. But this was just the tip of the iceberg. The shutdown of the canal for less than a week caused billions of dollars of damage to the world economy. Late deliveries of consumer goods, fuel, and raw materials created a tidal wave of problems that took several months to correct. Because of issues like this, Russia has been championing there to be an alternative to the Suez Canal to prevent this from happening again. But are their intentions really motivated by the greater good? Despite Russia's massive size and thousands of kilometers of coastline, it's not the most powerful maritime state by any metric for merchant marine tonnage, naval vessels, or commercial traffic. But why? Because of Russia's geography, most of its ports remain unusable for most of the year. This is because thick sheets of ice move in around the majority of Russia's ports, making getting in and out for about six months out of the year only possible with the assistance of an icebreaker. Due to Russia's historical issues with warm water port access, it has relied heavily on the Black Sea and its Kaliningrad enclave because Kaliningrad, seized from Germany at the end of World War II, is primarily a navy base. Russia uses its port as its main artery to export goods. Because Russia is like a giant gas station and breadbasket with limited domestic manufacturing capabilities compared to other developed countries, getting oil, natural gas, and grain out of the country by sea is a huge deal to them. But there is just one problem. As the war in Ukraine has shown, the Black Sea is not Putin's uncontested backyard like he thought. The Ukrainian military has been able to sink about 20% of Russia's Black Sea fleet as of the making of this video and open its own grain corridor to export foodstuffs at will. Because Russia's dominance over the Black Sea is not guaranteed, not to mention Russian goods having to pass through the Dardanelles, a narrow strait controlled by NATO country Turkey, Russia has been looking for an alternative for a few years now. Then the sanctions hit the Russian economy. Collectively, countries of the free world have levied thousands of separate sanctions against Russia. In addition to governmental sanctions, thousands of corporations have stopped doing business with Russia altogether. As a result, Russia has been effectively cut down from the European economy and starved of quality manufactured goods. It needs a faster way to get its raw resources to other countries. Lastly, it requires a new market for its goods. But where? Since the war started, Russia has made it official policy to pivot towards the global south. 
China, India, and Southeast Asia are prime markets Russia hopes to hawk its wares in. But with few friends left in the world, Russia has turned to similarly sanctioned countries like Iran for help accomplishing this goal. But why are Russia and Iran joining forces, and for what purpose? Ever since the 1960s, Russia, then known as the Soviet Union, has been trying to get an alternative to the Suez Canal. The original plan was to create a literal canal that began at the Caspian Sea. From there, the canal could take one of two routes. The shorter and more difficult route to the Persian Gulf through Iran's mountainous northwest. Then there was the much longer route, which would have been around 1,000 kilometers and would have gone through the eastern side of Iran to the Indian Ocean. Besides decades of sanctions Iran has faced over its support for terrorism, nuclear weapon program, and other crimes, the country's economy has become a shell of its former self. With Russia now similarly cut off from the rest of the world, the two decided to come together after the war in Ukraine started. Though cooperation was initially purely about trading raw materials for military technology, the two governments soon developed an even closer bond. They see that the only way the two can survive for the future is to band together to face their common enemy in the West. But how can the two create an economic powerhouse that is virtually sanction-proof? Known officially as the International North-South Transport Corridor, or INSTC, this is an idea that has been championed by the two countries over the past decade but has only taken off in recent years because of the war in Ukraine. While the basic principle of a transit route that is shorter and cheaper than the Suez remains the same, the two countries have abandoned the original idea of building a giant canal in Iran. Instead, both countries have agreed that the best solution is to build a three-tiered, multimodal transport lane that stretches from Russia in the north through or around the Caspian Sea, links up in Tehran, and then heads south to Bandar Abbas. From there, cargo, fuel, or other goods can be loaded onto ships and sent into India. When talking about the INSTC, there are three routes that Russia intends to construct that revolve around how to get around the Caspian Sea. There is the western route that stretches from Astrakhan in Russia, through Azerbaijan, and into Iran. The Trans-Caspian route is a straight shot from Russia over the Caspian Sea via ship, terminates in Iran, and then travels by rail. Then there is the eastern route, which is a combined road and rail network that starts once again at Astrakhan, goes through Kazakhstan and Turkmenistan, into Tehran, and from there to the sea. Since 2002, Russia and Iran have been jointly working on their plan. Beginning with the Trans-Caspian route, the two countries performed the first test run using existing infrastructure. In the summer of 2002, Russian shippers sent two container boxes of wood from St. Petersburg that traveled via rail, ship, road, rail, and ship again. And just over three weeks later, the wood was delivered to port in Mumbai, India. Since this initial test run, Russia and Iran have made unknown progress on the INSTC. While Russia and Azerbaijan signed an almost $2 billion deal last year to fund the missing link for the Western Route Railroad, Russia has been keeping silent on the progress of its other priority projects. If the INSTC became the new Suez Canal, both countries would greatly benefit. For starters, the Suez Canal Authority brings in about $5 billion in revenue annually. How this would be split among Russia, Iran, and other participating countries is unknown. However, having $5 billion in foreign currency would do a great deal of good for both countries, as it would allow them to fund their various wars, terrorist groups, and other pet projects without worthless riles and rubles. Another benefit of the INSTC would be that it would give Russia and China leverage over Europe again. Remember when European countries first spoke out against Russia, and Russia responded by turning the taps off of oil and natural gas or demanding payment in rubles? A similar situation could play out, where Western governments could be forced to concede concessions if Russia controls trade into Europe. Having the INSTC is also a convenient replacement for the Suez Canal because of Iran's control of terrorist groups in the Middle East. For example, the Iranian-backed Houthis have carried out dozens of attacks against shipping since October. In the past six months, these attacks have dramatically reduced Suez Canal traffic as shippers take the longer, more expensive, but safer route around southern Africa. 
it is certainly not a stretch of the imagination to think in a dispute that Iran could help steer traffic towards their route by encouraging or outright demanding more attacks against Western shipping heading towards the Suez. Shippers would then have a financial incentive to use the INSTC, which is arguably the worst possible scenario. But is all of this likely? If the INSTC were fully operational, as Russia and Iran hope it to be, it wouldn't matter. Even with the threefold increase in Russia-Iran trade to $5 billion last year, this trade is still mostly between the two countries. Most foreign companies are hesitant to do business with either country because they want to avoid being sanctioned by their own government. Of course, not all countries have sanctions against Russia, most notably India and China. However, a project like this directly conflicts with China's own world image, as it intends to promote global trade with the Belt and Road Initiative. Because of this, it is likely that China, Russia's biggest target audience, would not allow its own companies to compete with itself as it builds its own road, rail, and port projects around the world. Due to this, though the INSTC might be built, it will ultimately be like the empty yet giant highways in North Korea, large, expensive to produce, and ultimately with little to no traffic. Bye for now.